Hello, pet up. Only me, back again. Double double today, just because you've all been lovely and patient, so muchly appreciate you. There's been chitter chatter about the um, the commencement of the hair fever season, the pollen season, and I was chatting on about the calendar and the geographical calendars you can get for pollen and the types of pollen that they'll be out there, like is it going to be trees, is it going to be weeds, is it going to be grass, is it going to be flowers, is it going to be crops, and so on and so forth, but not in so many words. But do you have difficulties with pollen? And if so, out of interest, what time of the year? What time of the year do you find it worst? And what time of the day? But if you think about it, next thing we know, we're going to be all complaining about how sweltering hot it is. And then it's going to be raining too much. And then it's going to be Christmas and it's all busy in the shops. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> right then. So let's crack on as usual. Um, I'll ask you and say, could you please hit the like button and notifications bell and share and subscribe if you want to. But don't if you don't want to. But we are on May Contain Traces of Magic, J.W. Wells & Co. Book 6. Chapter 6. There were, of course, alternative explanations. For example, the demon who had abducted Chris yesterday had borrowed Angela's car while she was in her room doing her college assignment and put it back again after the bungled kidnapping attempt was over. Piece of cake for a demon, but why bother? Any old car would have done, since he hadn't had a clue what she drove, or even if she had a car at all. All right then, how about she was a distinctly unnerving driver, and the nail marks weren't his, they'd been left there by a previous passenger. He liked that one a lot, but he didn't believe it. On the other hand, did he really believe that Angela, the trainee, vouched for by Mr Burnotts, hand-picked by JWW Retail as a future jewel in their corporate crown, was really in league with demons and had helped them set him up? Harder to swallow than a razor blade. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Also, the same objection held true. Why use her car? He thought again, when any old banger of the street would have done just as well. Unless, of course, the jeep had been specially modified to do the necessary magic to get him into the demon's dimension. As a hypothesis, however, it was still thin enough to grace any catwalk in Paris, and even if he believed it, which he didn't, what, being realistic, was he proposing to do about it? Well, one thing Chris quite definitely wasn't going to do was risk any sort of confrontation. Quite apart from the possibility that Angela had demon allies at her beck and call, accusing someone of being a cat's paw for the forces of darkness would be quite excruciatingly embarrassing. How would he work it into the conversation? And what was he supposed to say when she looked at him and said, You what? No. A sensible, rational man would do what sensible, rational men are supposed to do when confronted with the raw face of evil. (laughs) Look the other way until it's gone and then call a policeman. In this case, Jill. Either she'd tell him not to be so paranoid, in which case he could revert to the terrified previous passenger theory and think no more of it, or else Jill would send in the black helicopters and it would be out of his hands and someone else's problem. Assuming, of course, that she wasn't leading him into another trap. Well, he could feel the casing of the tape measure pressed by the seat against his hip. He felt slightly reassured, but not nearly enough. Here we are, Angela was saying. Boys Dark Road, that's the address, isn't it? Chris nodded. About halfway down on the right, uh, I usually park on the petrol station forecourt, just opposite. Look, Messrs Ackery and Sleard, trading as Magical Mystery Tour, a hard sell at the best of times, But although they were notoriously reluctant to take more than one dozen of anything, except DW6, of course, he'd always gotten well with Dennis and Frank. A plan of action started to take shape in his mind. Hi, Dennis. Big smile. Look, can I use your phone? My battery's flat. No problem. He left Angela the trainee giving Dennis the BB27K spiel and darted into the stockroom. 
So far, so good. So far, and no further. The voice at the other end of the line was sorry, but Miss Etting Smith was out of the office for the rest of the day. Yes, they had her mobile number, but they weren't authorised to disclose it. They would, of course, be overjoyed if he left a message for her and would pass it on as soon as she came in tomorrow morning. No, they couldn't pass on a message right now, as Ms Etting Smith had left strict instructions that she wasn't to be disturbed except in an emergency. No, they weren't prepared to accept his assurance that this was an emergency and they'd be obliged if he wouldn't take that tone with them. So sorry, have a nice day. Chris hung up, feeling worried. Always the problem with policemen. Never one around when you really needed one. Ludicrous situation, he thought. There he was, doing the rounds with someone he had a reason to suspect was in league with the common enemy of man. A half-sensible human being would run a mile, hide, emigrate to somewhere comparatively safe, like Iraq or Afghanistan, instead of getting back in the car. The quite possibly enchanted car in which he'd very nearly been murdered less than 24 hours ago, and driving to Litchfield to sell yet more powdered water to the retail magic trade. Why? because he was afraid that if he dropped everything and ran for it, he'd lose his job? Well, fine, a bit like refusing to leave a burning house because you haven't finished watering the plants. I could do it, he thought. I could sneak out the back, get a bus into the town centre, find a travel agent, get myself booked on a flight to Switzerland, the only country in the world where magic doesn't work. Nobody had ever managed to find out why though it was generally reckoned that the banks had something to do with it. Stay there until it's safe to come back. He shrugged. It was entirely feasible, but he just couldn't do it. Purely and simply, because there was the possibility that he was wrong, and he wasn't being stalked by demons, which meant he'd be making a whole lot of inconvenient and disruptive fuss over nothing, and then he'd feel really, really quite silly. Quite. And no doubt that was probably the way people's minds had worked when there'd been a chance of stopping Hitler or containing the spread of the Black Death, which was just another way of saying that people tend to get what they deserve, true but massively, massively unhelpful. Did you make your call? The round, bearded face of Frank Ackery was beaming at him from the edge of the stockroom door. Chris nodded. Thanks, he said. Frank grinned. That assistant of yours, he said. Bit keen, isn't she? You could say that. Sorry, Chris said. Is she making a nuisance of herself? Shrug. She sold Dennis two dozen of those parking spaces of yours, which I'd have thought was impossible. And now she's within an ace of talking him into five dozen pairs of winged sandals, even though we've got nine dozen of the Zauberwerk version on the shelf right behind your rid, and you could grow potatoes in the dust. Frank sighed. Fifteen years we've been in business together. I'd have sworn he was charm-proof. She permanent or what? Chris shook his head. Management trainee, he replied, just getting a few weeks' experience in the trenches. Thank God for that, Frank replied. Last thing this business needs is reps who actually sell us stuff. Quite. That was the cheery badinage done with, but Frank didn't move. He was deciding whether to say something. I gather you've had an exciting time of it lately. Who told you that? My cousin Penny in demon control, Frank replied. Like your shirt, by the way. The polo shirt, with DS on the pocket. Not mine, Chris said. Borrowed it from, she told me, Frank went on, dropping his voice a little, that you've had a bit of aggravation from them. No need to ask who they were. Yes, Chris said. Sorry to hear it, Frank said gravely. Been there, he added. Not nice. Did you ever know Billy Tomacek? The name's vaguely familiar. Frank nodded. My best mate at school, he said. Married my cousin Penny. The reason you recognise the name is he was killed by demons about five years ago. The biggest bit of him they ever recovered fitted nicely on a microscope slide. Oh, You could say that, yes. Reason I bring it up is, before they killed him, they'd been hassling him for weeks, turning up everywhere he went, that sort of thing. The first three times he managed to give them the slip, 
He was a bright lad, Billy. I see, Chris said, his voice suddenly weak. Uh, what, what happened? Frank was silent for a moment. We're still not exactly sure, he said. He left a message on Penny's phone at work to say he'd got her message and he'd see her there, which didn't make any sense, because she hadn't called him. So they took his answering machine apart and found it stank of demons. One of them must have got inside it and left a false message from Penny telling him to meet her somewhere. And that's where they were waiting for him. He shrugged. No idea why, of course. It's like they picked him at random. The only link was Penny working for the department. But that's a bit tenuous, obviously. Quite, Chris thought, as far-fetched as his best friend being the head of the demon hunters. A coincidence, he heard himself say. We just don't know. The only other thing he said was in his last message, and it was something about Gandhi, which makes no sense at all. Anyway, when Penny told me about your spot of bother, I thought I know him. He comes in our shop. Next time I see him, I'll tell him to keep his head down. So, Frank added, then gone. <laughs> yes, Chris said feebly. Right. Also, a marked hesitation this time. You might find you have a use for these. Frank dipped his fingers into the top pocket of his jacket and fished out a pair of sunglasses. Here, he said. Try them. Chris frowned. But it's not very bright in here, Frank. Try the fucking sunglasses, Chris. Put like that, how could he refuse? He took them and noticed just how heavy they felt, as though the frames were lead and the lenses inch-thick steel. He perched them on his nose. They hurt. Fine, he said in a suffering, gladly voice. So what's the big O? Frank was still there, still standing exactly where he'd been a moment ago. But there was a difference. To be precise, he had something sitting on his shoulder. It wasn't a bird, but it had wings. It most definitely wasn't human, though it had hands and feet and a more or less round head. Frank... Chris said quietly. What's that on your... Frank smiled at him. My constant companion, he replied. Ever since Billy died, other people have chips on their shoulders when they're pissed off about something. You might say this is taking it to the next level. Frank, the thing, whatever it was, yawned, revealing three rows of upper jaw teeth and four below. It had eyes, and the lobes of its ears drooped like streamers. It's a fury, Frank said. Oh, there's loads of other names for them. It's a cross between a memory and an obligation, I guess you could say. Or an external conscience, maybe. Like I said, it came to live with me when Billy died, because he was my best friend, and there wasn't anybody else. Oh, it'll stay there until I do something about his death, and since I'm a coward, that means we're more or less stuck with each other. Actually, it's no bother. Doesn't eat much. Toilet trained. You'd hardly know it was there. And nobody else can see it, of course. Not unless they're wearing the specs. Chris thought about that. Uh, hardly any bother. Grin. He talks to me, Frank said, when we're alone. Reminds me. Really very polite and reasonable. You couldn't accuse it of making a fuss. It just says things like... Pity Billy couldn't be here to see that. Oh, that's a good one. Just wait till you tell Billy. No, sorry, I forgot. You can't. The really bad thing is, you get used to it after a while. I feel a bit ashamed about that. The fury stretched its wings, gently brushing Frank's cheek. It'd be like a brief, itchy feeling, Chris supposed. Then it stuck its head under one wing and went to sleep. Anyway, Frank said, that's the glasses for you. You'd be amazed what you can see with them on. Not a JWW product, he added. Fine workhouse of Vienna, pre-war. Haven't been made for years, so they're pretty rare now. I'll have them back when you're finished with them. But right now, I reckon your need's greater than mine. The pain in Chris's nose was getting tiresome. He slipped the glasses off, and at once the fury disappeared. Can they show up? Demons. Frank nodded, but not all the time, which is a bit of a bummer. As I'm sure you know, 
demons don't hang around this dimension any more than they can help. Once they come through, of course, they're pretty obvious. You don't need smart specs to see them. Otherwise, when they're on the other side of the line waiting to come through, the specs aren't a lot of use. Except for one thing. You get a sort of shimmer effect. A bit like... Oh, so did, he said, as the phone started to ring. Hang on, I'd better get that. Don't go away. While Frank was talking, just a bunches of yeses and ices, Chris examined the sunglasses a little bit more closely. The frames looked like plain orange plastic, but he could just make out, in tiny raised letters on the sides of the arms, the letters DS. Sorry about that, Frank said, and his voice was distinctly strained. Anyway, there you go. Hope they'll be of some use to you. I'd better get back to the shop now, if that's OK. Hang on, Chris said. What about the... He was talking to an empty doorway. Odd, he thought, to break off like that, just as he got to the useful bit. A sort of shimmer effect. Could mean anything. Even so, now he came to think of it, he had an idea he'd heard of something similar. Not sunglasses but a mirror in which things were reflected as they truly were, not as they pretended to be. The same basic technology, presumably. In any event, he could see how they could come in very, very handy, and not just for identifying demons. Then he thought about the fury, and it occurred to him that some things are best not seen. He went back through into the shop. Frank was serving a customer, a refill for one of the old PP12N genie lamps by the look of it, while Angela was showing off the new GF92 instant thunderstorm to a thoroughly dazed looking Dennis Slade. Wisely, she'd set it up inside an upturned goldfish ball, and even from across the room he could see the lightning flashes piercing the inky black clouds. Frank won't like that, he thought. He'd bought 15 of the old model last year, and even though the R&D people swore blind that they'd thoroughly debugged it and was now possible to turn it off, Chris realised he was still holding the sunglasses. Quickly he slipped them into his pocket, almost as if he was afraid Frank could change his mind and ask for them back. Give them back. No chance. The thought crossed his mind the way a rabbit darts across the road in front of you, just before you jump on the brakes and listen to your tyres lose half their value. (laughs) Stupid, he thought. If Frank wants them back, of course he'd return them. He just hoped very much that he wouldn't. The replacement genie was being difficult about going into the bottle. The customer was holding tightly onto the lamp while Frank tried to squish the little swirling blue cloud down into the spout with the palm of his gloved hand. Clearly a generous man. He'd misjudged him all these years. But then, he thought, I'd never have guessed about his long-term companion unless I'd seen it for myself. Something like that must do strange and terrible things to you. A sort of shimmer effect. He tried to picture it. No, too vague. Well, now, he realised Dennis Slade was talking to him. I think that's everything. No, hang on. We haven't done the dried water. Better make it six dozen. We're down to our last curtain. Been a hell of a run on it the last couple of weeks. If you hadn't been coming in today, I'd have had to phone you. Can you talk to the warehouse? See if they can't hurry it up a bit. Chris wrote up the order in his book, deliberately taking his time, but Frank was still fully occupied with the genie. He'd managed to stuff it in head first, but its claws and tails appeared to have got stuck, like Winnie the Pooh in the rabbit hole, and Angela was giving Chris meaningful looks. Come on, let's get out of here before they change their minds. Gandhi, he thought, and if that's a coincidence, I'll eat my own head. He couldn't stay in the shop any longer without drawing attention to himself, so he smiled. Thanked Dennis Slade, asked him to get Frank to ring him about the thing they'd been talking about and followed Angela back into the street. How about that then? Her face, no longer pointed like a weasel's, but attractively heart-shaped, was glowing. Two dozen of the BB27Ks, five dozen MP66As, a whole palette full of the multifunction mega curses and fifty instant thunderstorms. She smiled at him and said... 
I can see why you like doing this job. It's a real buzz, isn't it? Yes. I've got to admit, she rattled on, I think I nearly blew it with the mega curses. I could feel I was pushing him where he didn't want to go, and he'd have taken twelve dozen just so I'd let him off the hook. But there was this little voice in my head saying, Go on, you can do it. So I pressed him, and it was really close, but I kept on and he gave in, and after that it was easy. I think I could have sold him anything by then. In the end, I guess I was feeling sorry for him. After all, she added sagely, Got to remember we're in this for the long term, the sustainable trading relationship. If we kid them into taking stuff, they'll never be able to shift. We're shooting ourselves in the foot. We want them to trust us to know what they need better than they do. Angela got in the car and reached across to unlock the passenger door. Chris opened it, but didn't get in. Scared? Well, naturally, but it wasn't a fear so much as the bewilderment. Hop in, she ordered. It's Magewald in Litchfield next, isn't it? Switzerland, he thought. Alps and banks and edelweiss and cowbells and men in leather trousers with feathers in their hats. Not in the EU, as far as he could remember, so you'd need a visa. And very expensive, someone had told him. Four quid for a beer and the cheese is all runny. Better. Braver to steer the course. He hopped in, as ordered, and put on his seatbelt. I was thinking, Angela said, as she ground the jeep into first gear and pulled away, testing the reflexes of an oncoming lorry. How'd it be if, instead of pushing the BB27Ks, we sort of try and make out they're really hard to get hold of, you know, demand much higher than anticipated, and say, we're really sorry, but we're having to ration them no more than six dozen per customer. That'll make them scared they might miss out, and when we let them twist our arms and sell them eight, a sort of shimmer effect. Well, maybe he'd recognise it when he saw it. Chris took the sunglasses out of his pocket and folded back the arms. Mind if I borrow them? Before he could answer, she'd snatched them out of his hand and shoved them onto her nose. Thanks, she said. Bright sunlight when I'm driving gives me the most appalling headaches. For the record, it was overcast. Dark and gloomy, ideal vampire street party weather. He took a deep breath and said... Excuse me, but would you mind giving those back? She didn't seem to have heard him. Usually I keep a pair in the glove box, she said, but like a fool I didn't put them back last time, and now can I find them? These are pretty good, not too dark. I can't be doing with those Polaroid things. If you ask me, they're a bit heavy. Really? Can't say I'd noticed. And we needn't just stick to the BB27 case, Angela went on. We can sort of drop pints as a snarl up with shipping or something. Four or five lines in danger of running out. So panic by now while stocks last. She laughed attractively. I expect all this is really old stuff. And I'm reinventing the wheel like mad. But Chris tried to make a grab for the glasses. But she was too quick for him. She slapped away his hand so hard that he yelped. What are you doing? She squealed. But he tried again. This time she swerved, whacked into the central crash barrier, bounced off it and ended up in the long grass at the side of the road. But she still had the glasses. She took them off and closed her fist around them. That was pretty stupid, she said. We could have been... Who are you? he said. Angela turned her head and looked at him. And all the glamour was gone. Her face was thin and sharp again. Her nose a beak. Her mouth a two-dimensional line. Are you feeling all right? She said. No. Answer the fucking question. A moment of perfect stillness and quiet. Then she shrugged. Give you a clue, she said. Nice shirt. What? Oh, you mean... Got one just like it, she said, only in pale blue. Lieutenant Angela Schlager, Demon Control Directorate. She paused, then said, You're supposed to give me the password. For a moment, Chris's mind went blank. Then he realised, She doesn't know it's not my shirt. DS. He scrabbled in his memory, then said, 
Delendi stunned? She nodded briskly. That's the trouble with this organisation, she said. Paranoia. Nobody talks to anybody else. I mean, it wouldn't have killed Dave Burnott to tell me you're on the job too. Without thinking, Chris said, Is he? Angela laughed. There you go, she said. Proves my point. You work for the creep. At least that's your cover. And you don't even know he's on the bloody team. We're all so busy playing spies, we end up with a stupid situation like this. In fact, if you hadn't been wearing the logo, I'd never have guessed either. A bit bloody obvious, by the way, she added. You know, they're only supposed to be worn off duty, like the baseball caps. Baseball caps? Chris repeated to himself, yes. Of course an organisation like that would have baseball caps and sweatshirts and sports bags and probably golf umbrellas too, all with the logo on. You were probably issued with them on compulsory paintball weekends. Sorry, he said, about... She shrugged. My fault, she replied. Should have guessed as soon as I saw the glasses. She leaned across him, opened the glove compartment and produced an identical pair. Did you really think I was, you know? He nodded. Sorry about that, too, he said. That's all right, she said indulgently. So what have you got? Ah. Then inspiration struck him, and he said, You first. That was all okay, apparently. Well, Angela said, I'm almost certain we've traced it to Nottingham, which means it's very likely that the first one you saw was just a scout probably from a completely different faction and not really anything to do with our boy. Obviously, your run-in yesterday shows they don't know any more than we do, which I guess is encouraging. It's the second one that's got us puzzled. We think... She paused to look him in the eye. We think that one was her. It took Chris a moment to remember how his mouth worked. Where is she? the demon had asked. You think so? Angela nodded. It all fits, doesn't it? Look, we know she's on the run and the other factions are after her. She needs a place to hide, but she desperately wants to be able to come back as soon as it's reasonably safe. Where better to go to ground till the heat's off? I mean, nobody would think of looking for her there and even if the other lot found her, they wouldn't be able to break in. At the very least, she'd be protected as long as she sat tight. What do you think? I think I could quickly learn to love runny cheese and cowbells. It's possible, certainly, he said. But, but, I know what you're going to say. You're going to argue that if you and I could figure that out, so could they, and so they didn't need to scoop you in yesterday. Or maybe they're just thick, or maybe they don't talk to each other, just like us. She shrugged. What's your take on all that? I mean, you're the one it all happened to. You actually saw her. Well? Chris thought of all the films, and the cop shows, and smiled gently as he said, Sorry, can't tell you that. At least, not till I've cleared it with Jill first. It was the only name he had to drop. But sometimes, one is enough. Angela's eyes widened for a moment. You report directly to Colonel Lettin Smith? He nodded. The stern, taciturn type. You've come across her then? She recruited me, Angela replied. In my first term at Loughborough. Sorry, she added. I hadn't realised you were special ops. Indulgent grin, setting a bewildered subordinate at her ease. It's like you said, he told her. Nobody talks to anybody else in this man's organisation. He was quite proud of this man's, though he couldn't remember offhand where he'd got it from. Mash, or the ear team probably. Anyhow, he went on. Now we've got that straight. Tell me something. Eager nod. Sure. Why the Instaglamour cream? Oh, Angela said. That. She shook her head. Does it bother you? Only, I can... It's not that, Chris said. I was just curious. You do know reps aren't allowed to use it, aren't they? Oh. He smiled. 
don't worry about it, he said. I expect Dennis and Frank will just assume you have a naturally bubbly and outgoing personality. Rye, she nodded. Actually, that's all it is. I mean, you've seen what I'm like without all this muck all over my face. Bit of a handicap when you're trying to get people to tell you things. So yes, sometimes I use the cream. But I won't do it again if it bothers you. You carry on if it helps you get the job done, Chris said magnanimously. Right, he went on. We'd better get a move on or we'll be late for Mage World. Don't want to blow our cover, do we? The rest of the deer was fraught and rather weird, but a considerable improvement nevertheless. Now that Chris had revealed himself as a fellow demon hunter, Angela seemed to regard him not just as a colleague, but a friend, and started telling him her life story. He learned, for instance, that she'd sworn to devote her life to the cause when her best friend's cousin's boyfriend's mother's nephew had been attacked and horribly maimed by demons, so that when Jill arrived at Loughborough on a recruiting drive, Angela had jumped at the chance. I've always wanted to do something that mattered, she said, you know, to make the world a better place and stuff. Originally it was going to be either working with endangered tapirs in Borneo or raising consciousness about the plight of the exploited copra miners of Kiribati. But then I realised what my true mission in life was and, well, since then I've never really looked back. A slice of luck. Chris couldn't help thinking for the copra miners of Kiribati. But he was generous enough not to begrudge it to them. That's wonderful, he said. To have a really genuine vocation, I mean. Angela did a no big deal shrug. You're the same, I bet, she said. I mean, none of us are in this for the money or the pension scheme. How about you? He was too weary to make something up, so he gave her an edited version of what had happened in the girls' toilets at school. It went down well. So you've known Colonel Lettin Smith for years, Angela said. That must have been awesome. I mean, she's so committed. I guess, he replied. But you know what it's like with people you were at school with? Even when they're 70 and all high court judges and cabinet ministers, you can't ever really bring yourself to believe they're grown-ups. I didn't have any friends at school, she replied solemnly. I hated them. They all hated me. That he could believe. Oh well, he said. All different now, I expect. Not really. She overtook a cyclist. He watched the poor devil in the mirror as he battled to regain control. But I've got my work, and that's all that matters, isn't it? Quite, Chris said. He had his work too, of course. Angela, however, continued to be an unethically, magically enhanced asset, even managing to bounce Bernie Place of Orion Sorcery into taking six dozen bottled genies and a whole kiss of blessings. Chris was so pleased, but surprised. As far as he was concerned, the glamour had worn off as soon as he accused her of using it. Bernie, however, showed all the signs of a glamour victim. Bulging eyes, glazed expression, difficulty with words, with an S in them. So apparently it was working on him. Presumably an open accusation broke the spell, worth remembering. By the time she dropped him off outside his flat that evening, he'd sold more in a day than he usually managed in a good week. There was a note from Karen on the kitchen table. Emergency meeting at the office. Didn't know when she'd be back. Chris scowled at it and threw it away. If she'd been home, he'd been going to tell her the whole story just to get it out of his system and, after all, she was in the business, considerably more knowledgeable and high-powered than he was. For all he knew, she might have been able to come up with a sensible course of action. Instead, he phoned Jill and got her answering machine. He left a message. Call me as soon as you can. He microwaved a pizza, poured himself the last can of beer and switched on the telly, which offered him a choice between snooker, two soaps, and a makeover show. He reckoned he'd suffered enough for one day, so he switched off and decided to play some music while he caught up on his ironing, which had been building up, rather, to the point where it represented the domestic equivalent of the third world debt. 
For some reason, he couldn't seem to find any of his usual comfort listening, just heaps of Karen stuff which tended to give him headaches. At the back of the drawer, however, he unearthed a CD he couldn't remember having seen before. It had an all-black sleeve on which glowed the silver words, Now that's what I call really bad music, 56. Hmm, he thought, and glanced at the list on the back. Nothing he'd ever heard of, but he was intrigued and put it on. Now, as a professional salesman, Chris was impressed. Here was an item of merchandise that really did deliver exactly what it promised on the box. But there's a sort of magic about extremely bad music. When you're in just the right kind of mood, you carry on listening in awed fascination to see if it can really get any worse, and you're really disappointed. He stuck it for 25 minutes and found that he'd polished off six shirts, nine handkerchiefs, eight tea towels and a couple of pillowcases without even noticing. Charms to soothe, he thought. He took the disc out, gelled it securely in its box and stuck it in his jacket pocket. Jill rang back as he was putting the ironing away. Angela Schlager, she repeated. Yes, I know her all right. Thin girl, pointy face. That's her. Looks a bit like she stole a magic ring 500 years ago and she's been guarding it in a cave under a mountain ever since. Keen, though. Maybe a bit too keen. Why? Chris explained, all except the poor law shirt bit. Instead, he attributed his outing of her to intuition. It didn't sound right, but Jill didn't pick him up on it. It's going to be a bit awkward, he went on. I mean, I'm stuck with her for weeks still. What if I say something and she realises I've been lying? You'll feel really stupid, Jill replied reasonably. Talking of which, why did you pretend to be one of us? It seems like such an odd thing to do. Minus the poor law shirt and Angela leaping to conclusions on the strength of it, the story did seem a bit dubious. Dunno, really, he replied. I guess I wanted to find out what she knew. Oh? Why? in case it was something to do with all this horrible stuff that's been happening to me, which it is, obviously. He hesitated, then said, I don't suppose you can tell me? You don't suppose exactly right, sorry. Ah, well, Chris tried to sound more disappointed than he actually was. Really, though, he was more concerned with getting off the subject of why he'd pretended to be an undercover demon hunter. Well, that's all I wanted to ask, really. Thanks. No problem. Oh, by the way, Jill added, we're finished with your car, so you can have it back. We'll drop it around first thing in the morning, so you can use it for work. Excellent, he said. Not sure I could have taken another day of your esteemed colleague's driving. I mean, she did a fantastic job of taking my mind off being haunted by demons, but on balance, I think the demons are less of a threat. Karen got home shortly after eleven, just as Chris was about to go to bed. He got as far as, you'll never guess what happened, but then she turned out the light and went straight to sleep. When Chris opened the front door and saw his own car parked outside, he felt a lump in his throat that had nothing to do with porridge and stale bread. True, compared with the BMW or even the Jeep, it was just a tin can on wheels, but it was, in a very real sense, his home, more so than the flat could ever be. It was his main defensible spears where he could retreat and lock the doors in the world and he missed it. Satnav wasn't there, of course. There was just a smudge on the windscreen where her rubber sucker had been and the knob was back on the lighter socket where her flex used to plug in. He reminded himself of how narrow his escape had been and started the engine. Angela wasn't pleased. I like driving she protested, when he told her they'd be using his car instead of the jeep. He pointed out that it wasn't fair on her to put all those extra miles on her personal vehicle when the company supplied him with a car. She assured him that she wasn't bothered about that, but he insisted his conscience, he said, wouldn't let him. Conscience. The fury on Frank Ackery's shoulder. He shuddered. Angela said something about a nip in the air and turned the heater on. Maybe she was sulking about the car issue, or maybe she was thinking about something else. They drove on in silence for a while, 
and then Chris asked if she minded if he had the radio on. You go ahead, she replied, making it sound like he'd just declared war, and he thought, raw emotion at this hour of the morning, just what I really need. He stabbed the button with his finger and got music. Rather nice, though he hadn't heard it before. He was just getting into it when Angela reached across and turned it off. I was listening to that, he said. She scowled at him. We need to talk, she said. Oh, he thought, because when women say we need to talk, especially in that tone of voice, what they really mean is you're going to listen and it's going to take a very long time and the subject isn't going to be Aston Villa's chances of avoiding relegation. Fine, he said. Fire away. And then her phone rang. One of the things about demons that unsettled Chris, a very small thing compared to the rest of it, but disturbing nonetheless, if there really are such things as demons, does that necessarily imply that there's such a thing as God? Or is that just a sign of intellectual laziness and a failure to understand the maths and the metaphysics? Well, he thought, as Angela yanked out her phone and snapped, yes, at it. I can cut through all that stuff and say quite definitely that God exists and he's taken pity on me at last. Oh, and please, he added under his breath, please let it be her mother and keep her on the phone till we get to Stafford. And it was her mother and they were through Stafford and out the other side before Angela said her last, yes, I know, I'm sorry, and jammed the phone back into her pocket. And yes, it was a bit scary, but in the nicest possible way. You were saying he said smoothly. What? You wanted to talk to me about something. She gave him a foul look. Later, she said, we're nearly there. So we are. Well, never mind. Their first call was an old favourite of Chris's, Honest John's House of Spells, established 1956, an extraordinarily tall, Thin shop squeezed in between a tyre and exhaust place and a sandwich bar with stock piled up in heaps wherever you looked and a stuffed goblin on the counter instead of a cash register. Honest John had been Chris's first ever customer. He was almost as tall and thin as his shop with a greasy curtain of long grey hair, a matted beard like a vertical hearthrug and an eye patch. The scuttlebutt in the trade was that John was actually the last of the old Norse gods, hiding out from the countless firms of lawyers who wanted to serve him with product liability writs concerning the creation of the universe. Whatever, Chris had always got on well with Honest John, though he had a healthy respect for his pair of pet ravens. Morning, said John. He gave Angela a long, hard stare, then frowned and moved a little to the left so he couldn't see her. I've got a bone to pick with you. Oh, yes. Those crystal balls, John said. You can have them all back. Oh, Chris said. Don't they work? John grinned at him. They work just fine, he said. You power them up and the first thing you see is this product will cease to function 24 hours after the warranty expires. I got them all packed up out the back. You can take them on with you when you go. Fair enough, Chris said. Oh, this is Angela. She's... John didn't seem to have heard him. Just as well you're here, he said. I'm down to my last half dozen dried waters. Got any in the car? Several times Angela tried to butt in, but John seemed incapable of seeing or hearing her. He placed a large order for curses, took a dozen BB27 keys to see how they'd go and insisted on being shown the time-out instant bank holiday. It's pretty straightforward, Chris explained. It looks like an ordinary DVD, right? You stick it in any conventional DVD player and, hey presto, 24 hours of uninterrupted leisure time to spend as you wish and it's outside of linear time, so it's ideal for lunch times coffee breaks any time when you're stressed out and really need a breather. Look, I'll show you. Three minutes or 24 hours later, John said, There's a towel over there. Look, next to the card terminal. Thanks, Chris replied, rain dripping down his nose. You've got to admit, though, it's very realistic. I'll think about it, John replied, as Chris dried himself off. Now then... Ever-filled purses. I was thinking about doing a buy one, get one free. 
A very good order indeed, and it took a long time, partly because John wanted Chris to demonstrate several other lines, partly because the Ravens kept swooping down and trying to peck Angela's eyes out, and since John was refusing to acknowledge her existence, he couldn't be prevailed upon to call them off. In the end, she mumbled something about waiting in the car and fled. That was a bit uncalled for, wasn't it? Chris said, as the shop door closed behind her. What was? Oh well, he thought, and carried on writing out the order. When it was eventually finished, he asked if he could use John's bathroom. John looked at him. Are you sure? Well, yes, I mean, it's not quite desperate yet, but... Shrug. Second floor, first on your left. Passwords, gotter dummer dung. Hardly designed to inspire confidence, but it proved to be a perfectly ordinary shop toilet. Narrow, faintly grubby, wisps of dusty cobwebs festooning the pipes. Cardboard boxes of stock blocking access to the facilities. Brick dust in the sink. A bent coat hanger in place of the more usual chain, and the door wouldn't shut properly. Chris washed his hands in grey water, wiped them on the threadbare towel, and reached out to put the seat back down. Odd he thought. Since he'd used it, about ten seconds ago, the lavatory had changed. Instead of a short drop and disinfectant blue meniscus, there was a tunnel, a bit like the London Underground, stood on end. It was lit by flaming torches in holders driven into the wall at regular ten-yard intervals, blurring into a solid line of light in the far distance. He felt a surge of vertigo and straightened up quickly, grabbing the towel rail for support. Not a pretty sight, but by no means the strangest thing he'd ever seen in a shop toilet. He turned to leave and collided with honest John, who was standing in the doorway. John grinned at him. Now wash your hands, he said. I already did, Chris replied. Fine, John said, and shoved him hard in the chest. Chris lurched backwards, and the insides of his knees hit the rim of the toilet bowl and buckled. For a moment he seemed to hover, arguing the toss with gravity. Then he toppled backwards through the hole in the toilet seat, which opened like a mouth to swallow him. His head caught the edge of the seat and he yelped, and then he was plummeting through empty air, a line of upside-down torches flashing past his eyes as he fell. Ooh, Zonis John then. E. I think those ravens might have had a job to do, don't you? Mm -hmm. So, I hope you enjoyed this second instalment today. That was Chapter 6 of May Contain Traces of Magic, J.W. Wells and Co. Book 6. And hopefully in a couple of days, we'll have a Chapter 7. All being well, we like this. Um, but it'll be the weekend, so it's more than likely. <laughs> So, my lovely beans, if you could bing, bing the like button and hit the notifications bell if you haven't already. I know it's a pain and I do say it every time and I'm really sorry. But if it's your first listen, if you could hit that notifications bell. If you like it, subscribe. If you want to, share. But you don't have to, obviously, but it always helps me out. And and if you enjoy it, please hit that like button because that looks really, really good. And I, and I like it and it makes me smile. Did I say that already? If I did, I'm really sorry. It's been a long day. But, yes, have a lovely couple of days and hopefully I'll have another chapter for you um, at the weekend. But most importantly, get some good rest, have some good food and smile. <laughs> Take it easy. E, I keep forgetting. Bing! <laughs>